Oh, hey. Have you ever wanted to implement your own virtual machine or emulator for an existing system like a game console or a retro computing device? Then you might find today's episode of Idiomatic Kotlin particularly interesting. My name is Seb and I welcome you to join me in solving another Advent of Code challenge. Today we are simulating, diagnosing and fixing a small made-up game console. And as usual, a bunch of Kotlin features will help us in achieving that goal. Things like sealed classes, sequences, and immutability. We have a lot ahead of us, so let's start. But first, my quick plea. If you're one of the 60% of our viewers that are not yet subscribed to our channel, do leave a comment down below on why that's the case. Or, well, even easier, just hit the subscribe button under the video and join our Kotlin community here on YouTube. We'd love to have you here. Now, before we jump straight into writing the Kotlin code, let's actually spend some time understanding the challenge that awaits us. The story goes like this. Another passenger on our flight hands us a little retro game console that won't turn on. It somehow seems to be stuck in an infinite loop, executing the same program over and over again. Of course, our first instinct is that we want to fix it. In the first step, we want to run a simulation of the program on our own. And then at a later point, we want to fix the console so that it doesn't get stuck in a loop anymore. You can find the full problem description on adventofcode.com as well, but we're gonna spend a significant portion of this video discussing how this challenge works, so feel free to keep on watching. The input for our challenge is a bunch of instructions instructions which are executed by the gaming device. If you've ever delved into the depth of how computers work, you might recognize this as some kind of assembly language. Essentially simple low-level instructions for a processor that are executed one after the other top-down, without all the fancy bells and whistles that higher level languages like Kotlin offer. But it seems our particular program at some point ends up in an infinite loop. By looking through the code, as well as the problem description, we can identify three different types of instructions. Nop, jump, and ack. Always accompanied by a number. If we're feeling fancy, we can actually refer to those using the industry standard terms. The first part of the instruction is usually called the opcode. The second part is called the immediate value. Our problem statement gives us some hints on how to interpret the combination of opcodes and immediate values. The easiest instruction is the nop instruction. It doesn't do anything really. It just advances to the following instruction. That's also where it gets its name, no operation. And while it comes with an immediate number, we don't really care about that at this time. The next instruction is the jump instruction. Normal people will probably pronounce that one as jump because that's exactly what it does. Instead of going to the next instruction that follows immediately after the jump instruction, jumps the given number of instructions ahead or back. So we can read this line in our input program as jump three instructions ahead. In the context of a larger program, that would look something like this. We jump three instructions down. Remember that NOP simply continues advancing our program without doing anything else. So eventually we end up at the jump minus two instruction. Here we jump again, but this time in the other direction. Looking at this behavior, we can probably see how an infinite loop could happen in a program by jumping back up in the program and repeating the instructions over and over again. Lastly, we have the ACK instruction. It's an abbreviation for accumulator, a term for a so-called register where a CPU can save some useful data, like the result of an addition or a subtraction. So ACK plus five would mean add five to the current value of the accumulator. Because our challenge device is actually quite limited, this is the only real memory that exists. The device can store one useful number and only add or subtract. Not very fancy, but complex enough. We can trace the state of the ACK register throughout a small sample program with three instructions here. At first, the accumulator is zero. Then after executing the ACK plus three instruction, the accumulator would be three. Then our device executes ACK minus five, so our accumulator is minus two. And last, the ACK plus two gets executed and we end up with a final value of the accumulator as zero again. Now that we have developed a bit of an intuition for how the device works, we can make some deductions that will help us later model this machine in Kotlin. For example, we can now say that the current state of the machine can be fully described with just two numbers. The accumulator, that is the result of any calculations that we've made so far, and the index for the next instruction that we want to execute. In computing, that also has a fancy name, the instruction pointer or program counter. But again, just a fancy word for the number of the next instruction that we 
will be executed. So at this point, you might not be entirely convinced yet that this is actually the case. So tell you what, let's run through another sample program and see that this is actually true. Let's run through this small program by hand. It only has six instructions, so it shouldn't take us too long. We start with our accumulator and our instruction pointer at zero. That means the device loads and executes the instruction number zero, which adds three to the accumulator and advances the instruction pointer by one. And then the cycle begins again. We load the instruction number one and execute it. A knob doesn't do anything besides advancing to the next instruction. So the instruction pointer gets incremented and we move on to the add plus two instruction, which adds two to the accumulator. And we move on again. Now we hit the jump instruction. We add two to the instruction pointer, which is currently three, ending up with five. That's equivalent to jumping to the instruction with the fifth index. So we skip the knob instruction and continue execution straight with the ACK minus eight instruction. After applying that, we end up with an instruction pointer that's outside of the program, which indicates that we're done. All right, hopefully we're now all convinced that really all the moving parts are the accumulator and the instruction pointer. Lucky for us, I should say, since we have to implement all of that in Kotlin. But we can make one additional observation. Instructions behave just like functions. To be more precise, functions that take a pair of accumulator and instruction pointer and return a new pair of accumulator and instruction pointer. Looking at the ACK plus five instruction, we can think of it as a function that takes an accumulator and instruction pointer, let's say they're both zero, and adds five to the accumulator, and increments the instruction pointer. And the same story applies to NOP, but this one only increments the instruction pointer and leaves the accumulator alone. No operation, remember? And jump is the inverse, changing only the instruction pointer, in this case incrementing it by two, and leaving the accumulator alone. So to recap, our input is a bunch of instructions. These instructions can modify two things, which is the instruction pointer, which determines the next instruction to be executed, and the accumulator, which can just store a single number. Our little device reads an instruction, executes the instruction, and keeps doing that in a loop. It keeps going and going and going forever, unless we land in a situation where our instruction pointer ends up out of bounds. Okay, I think we have a pretty good idea, at least intuitively, about what's going on behind the scenes. Let's get to coding. To get our first star, we need to successfully run the program, uh, which we're given as a puzzle input. Because we're told this program is stuck in some kind of loop, the actual answer to the challenge is going to be the value of the accumulator immediately before we execute an instruction a second time. Now, before we even think about how to detect these loops, we can start by just building a small simulator for the device. We can start by modeling our machine and its instructions. During our discussion, we determined one important fact. The state of the whole machine can be described using just two numbers, the instruction pointer and the accumulator. So let's model this pair as an immutable data class. Then we need to define the three different types of instructions that the machine understands. I suggest creating a small class hierarchy to represent the different types of instructions, because that means we can share some attributes across all instructions and distinguish between the different type of the instructions that we might encounter. We also figured out that an instruction is really something that modifies our machine state. That's why we'll attach an action attribute to the instruction. That action is a function that transforms one machine state into a new one. Now we can create classes for each of the three types of instructions. However, remember that in Kotlin, we need to explicitly mark our instruction class if we want to create subclasses for it. The simple choice would be to mark the class as open, but we can do better. We can actually make sure that the compiler is aware of all the subclasses in our instruction class by marking the class as sealed. You may have come across sealed classes before or uh, even used them yourself, but still I'll point out where this choice helps us later in our solution as we come across it. Let's start with the easiest instruction first, the knob. All it does is do nothing, move on to the next instruction. Expressed in terms of the action, it simply creates a new machine state with an instruction pointer that is incremented by one. The accumulator remains unchanged. Note how we can use the typical lambda syntax here to define our action function and get the previous machine state as the implicitly named parameter it. Oh, and since all knobs behave the same, there's not really any point in distinguishing different instances. That's why I use the object keyword to create a singleton object instead of creating a whole class for this type of instruction. Next, let's tackle the jump instruction. From our discussion and the problem statement, we recall that the jump instruction only changes the instruction pointer because that's the part of our machine state that determines what instruction to run next. And for that, it uses its attached value, the number that follows the instruction. The accumulator remains unchanged. Lastly, we can still tackle the 
ACK instruction. This one does two things. It adds its immediate value to the accumulator and it increments the instruction pointer so that the program continues running with the next instruction. But even so, in the shape of its code looks pretty similar. All right, next we can move on to actually running a whole program, which really is just a list of instructions. So let's write up a function called execute that takes such a list and does exactly that. We start our device with an initial state. Both the instruction pointer and the accumulator are zero. Makes sense so far. The first instruction to execute would be at index zero of our list. And since we haven't done any kind of additions or subtractions yet, makes sense for the accumulated result to also be zero. Then we write up the main loop for our simulation. As long as our instruction pointer is a valid index, we read the instruction at that index from our list. We then apply the action that is associated with that instruction, feed it the current state of the machine, and get back the new state of the machine. To validate that this actually works as we expect it to, uh, we can add a little print message at this point just for good measure. If the program works all fine, then at some point the instruction pointer should go out of bounds and the program should terminate. To mark the time when that actually happens, we can again print a small diagnostic message here and just return the latest state of the machine. Because at that point, there would be nothing left to do for our program. That's our happy path, so to say. Well, seeing is believing, so let's quickly add the functionality required to read our program from the input text file. If you've watched any of our previous videos in the series, you probably already have a good idea of how we approach this. We open the file, read all the lines of text inside, and turn them into actual instruction objects by applying the map function. Of course, we also need to figure out what kind of instruction objects we actually want. To do so, we can create a small factory function that does two things. It uses the split function to turn the full lines into the instruction names and their associated values, and it also uses a when statement to instantiate the appropriate subclass, either nop, ack, or jump. Note that this is one of the few situations where the Kotlin style guide expressly allows us to start a function name with an uppercase letter, because what we're writing here is a factory function, and that is intentionally allowed to look similar to a constructor call. Okay, with that out of the way, we are ready to run our program by passing the list of instructions we just parsed to the execute function that we wrote moments ago. Okay, so we see our program running right in front of our eyes, and it doesn't terminate. Which makes sense because, well, our challenge was to find where our program begins infinitely looping after all, and then see what the last machine state is exactly before we enter the loop a second time. But hey, at least we know that the code is actually broken now. That's something. The good news is that we can easily retrofit this kind of cycle detection in our little execute function. Because to figure out when we see an instruction for the second time, we simply can keep track of each instruction index we encountered so far and just save that somewhere, for example, in a set. Whenever we're done executing an instruction, we just check whether our new instruction pointer contains a value that we've seen before. And if that happens, we know that we'd be executing an instruction for the second time. So we can terminate the execution and return the current state of the machine. So let's run our simulator again. And would you look at that? Indeed, our program successfully detects the loop and returns the last machine state before the cycle would continue. So we enter the accumulator value as returned by the function on adventofcode.com and celebrate our first star for this day's challenge. Lovely stuff. But as said before, we want to go beyond that. And we can actually try our hand at fixing the program we received. In part two of the challenge, we get an important hint. Exactly one instruction is the root cause for this infinite loop. Somewhere in this long list of instructions, one of the jump instructions is supposed to be a knob instruction or the other way around. Must have been compromised somehow. This challenge might sound tough at first, but we can actually try and solve it with a pretty straightforward approach. To find out which instruction needs fixing, we can simply generate all possible versions of the program where a knob has been exchanged with a jump and the other way around. We can then run them all and see if any of them terminate. I do propose a small optimization here though. Instead of creating all permutations, then executing all permutations, and then seeing which one successfully terminates without a cycle, we can use Kotlin sequences to do the same calculation, but lazily. And who doesn't love being lazy? Jokes aside, in the context of Kotlin programming, using sequences means that our code will only generate those adjusted programs that we actually need until we found a working version. And then it just terminates. 
Essentially, we create a mutated program, execute it, see if it terminates, and if it doesn't, we create the next mutation and run the check again. Let's start implementing this approach by defining a function called generate all mutations. The signature that you can see here already gives us a hint of what I'm intending to do here. It takes the original program as we have read it from our input and returns to us a sequence of other program codes that have been modified. Now, each element of that sequence will be a full program, but with one instruction exchanged. Now for the body of this function. To create such a lazy collection, we can use the sequence builder. For each instruction and its corresponding index, we create a fresh mutable working copy of the program and exchange a single jump with a knob or a single knob with a jump. If the index we're currently looking at is an ACK instruction, then we can just skip this permutation altogether. This is also one of those situations where we benefit from marking our instructions as sealed. Since the compiler and our tooling knows all existing subclasses, we can automatically generate all branches for our when statement here. And we also don't need to add an else branch to our statement either, because the compiler knows that these three values are the only values that can ever occur. And if we add another subclass later on, the compiler will complain until we address the handling of that new instruction in this block as well. Because sequences are lazy, we don't just return a list of programs at the end. Instead, after each iteration, we yield an individual value. That is, we hand over the value to the consumer of our sequence. When our program hits this point, our code here actually stops doing work until the next value in the sequence is requested, at which point we run the next iteration of our loop. That's the lazy part. Well, at this point, the compiler and IDE are still complaining, and for good reason. To make our code work, we need to make some adjustments to the model of our machine instructions. We previously said that all knob instructions are the same, and that we don't care about their immediate values either. Well, now we know that we actually need the values in order to generate the corresponding jump instruction. So the knob object is now a fully fledged class again with its very own value. Welcome to the club. This change also makes our factory function light up. So uh, we adjust the way we parse as well. Nice. Now we have a function that can generate all mutations of our input program that each have a knob and a jump switched out. That should be enough to get our second gold star, so let's get this running. In our main function, we now feed our original program to the generate all mutations function. That gives us the sequence of new altered programs. We execute those using a map statement, but again, lazily. So at this point, we have another sequence, this time the results of the programs. Because we're only interested in the first one where the instruction pointer went outside of the instructions of our program, we use the first function together with a predicate that expresses exactly that. This is also the so-called terminal operation of our chain of sequences. So at this point, we actually want to get a value back from all the laziness. So we turn our sequence into an actual machine state as returned by the execute function. Notice that we actually benefit from the fact that we just build a basic simulator first without caring too much about the detection of endless loops. We assumed that some programs might terminate, so we handled that happy path correctly from the beginning. That just made it all the more easy to get our second star by submitting the last state of the machine right before it terminates. With that, I suppose we could lean back and relax, or we could revisit our code a little more and talk about some of the decisions that we made. One of the key factors that comes to mind with an implementation like the one I presented is immutability versus performance. Because maybe without realizing it, this approach for defining and executing instructions as we've created it here creates a lot of objects. Specifically, each time the action associated with an instruction is invoked, a new machine state object is created. This approach has pros and cons. Generally speaking, using immutability like this can make it much easier to reason about your system, because you don't need to worry about somewhere, some code changing the internal state of the objects that you're referencing. While that might not apply here, uh, especially if your programs use concurrency, so coroutines or threads, that can become a really big deal. So it's worth considering an approach like this from the get-go. However, we are also paying a price uh, in the form of allocating many such objects. For a small simulation like the one that we have, you can tell it's still totally possible to do this approach, even when the task requires us to run like 600 modified programs. 
but if you're writing a simulator for some real retro gaming devices or just generally machines that can store more than a few numbers, this approach isn't really applicable. Imagine having to copy the whole contents of your machine's RAM every time your CPU executes an instruction. You can probably see why that wouldn't really work. I'd love to hear your opinion on this topic as well, by the way. Do you prefer writing immutable code or would you prefer solving a challenge like this one using mutable data structure? Leave a comment down below, share your motivations and thoughts on the topic. One opinion that's certainly worth reading is that of Kotlin team lead Roman Yelizarov. He actually published an article called Immutability We Can Afford, where he talks about this topic as well. You can find a link to that post in the description. If you're conscious about how you're architecting and optimizing your software, you might find that a compelling read. I mean, I still have you here, so why don't we just quickly build a mutable implementation of this challenge? It's not going to take long, and we'll even be able to do some armchair benchmarks to drive home the point about performance, and you'll be able to compare and, you know, form an opinion of the different approaches yourself. We're not going to completely rewrite the whole project, but instead we'll introduce a bunch of mutable structures in the scope of our execute function, or well, execute mutably function. We'll keep the signature the same so that we can just swap it in for other calls of execute. The main difference is that we'll store the instruction pointer and accumulator as mutable variables in the function body. And instead of relying on the action associated with an instruction, which allocates a new machine state object, Object, we introduce a when statement and just modify our local variables accordingly. Again, using the power of our sealed subclasses to keep this nice and tidy. The rest of the logic stays the same. We still keep track of the indexes we encounter and we still make sure that we return the last state of the machine when we terminate. In theory, that should behave exactly like our original execute function. To validate that assumption, we can add calls to this variant to our main function. And while we're at it, we'll also wrap these calls in measure timed value. That is an experimental function in the Kotlin standard library that can measure how long it takes for the block that is passed to execute and then also return the original value of that block. Of course, the measurements that we can obtain using this method are pretty flawed. We only run the process once and don't take into account things like JVM warm-up time and other things. If we need detailed numbers, we would be better off using a framework like Kotlin X Benchmark. But for a quick comparison, we can still get a basic understanding of the difference. While both implementations terminate within a pretty reasonable time frame, we are indeed paying a price when we use the version which makes heavy use of immutability. At the end of the day, performance considerations like this will have to ultimately be up to you, because programming is a game of trade-offs and choosing one of these implementations is one of them. All right, that about does it for today. Let's quickly recap some of the stuff that we saw. We saw how we can use sealed classes and lambdas to represent the instructions of our simulated device, making sure the compiler always looks over our shoulder and ensures that we handle all instructions correctly, even when creating alternative versions for our input program. We built a basic run cycle for our simulator, making sure we modify the machine state according to the instructions that we received, and we use Kotlin sets to discover loops in the execution of those input programs. We also saw a use of sequences and the sequence builder function to construct a lazy collection of programs uh, that we needed for our second challenge. And we saw how we would yield those individual sequence elements on demand. And lastly, we even took some performance metrics into consideration, evaluating a different approach for executing the program, doing some armchair benchmarking using the experimental measure timed value function. Of course, it might pay off for you to dive a little deeper into the topics that were used in today's episode. Your one-stop shop for learning more about everything from sequences to sets is of course kotlinlang.org. But we're also planning on covering many more of these topics in future videos. So subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit that bell to get notified when we continue the Kotlin journey. As usual, thanks to the folks behind Advent of Code, specifically Eric Vastel, who gave us permission to use the Advent of Code problem statements for this series. Check out adventofcode.com and do continue puzzling on your own. See you in the next one and take care.